Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on primary health care and COVID-19 that we are holding today, uh, June 30th, with a very distinguished panel. We are quite happy uh, to have several uh, high-level uh, panelists who are very well known for the work they have done in their countries on this topic in addition to our speaker from PAHO. So we have a total of four speakers. I'm going to put the agenda up on the screen so you can see it. As mentioned before, uh, this webinar is one of a series of webinars exploring the relationship between the COVID-19 pandemic and international health. It is sponsored by the Edmundo Grande Ugalde Leaders in International Health Program, also known as the LIHP. And uh, this particular webinar has been opened to a larger audience, uh, and we're really pleased to have this opportunity to offer this webinar to everyone here, given its importance. Some of you may have attended our previous webinar on this same topic, which was given in Spanish on 17 June. Uh, because of the high demand and also the uh, interest in doing this in English and in highlighting in particular some of the efforts that are moving forward in our Caribbean region, we have decided to hold this second webinar. And I really would like to thank Dr. Reynaldo Holder, who is our first speaker, who helped in organizing this webinar. Um, at this time, as well as our HSS Health Systems and Services Advisors in the three countries that we are highlighting today, the Bahamas, Dominica, and Jamaica. So uh, without further ado, let me begin with panelist introductions so that we can start the webinar. I think what I will do, because we have so many panelists, is I will introduce each one as we go along. I think that might make it a bit easier. I'll just do a brief introduction of who everyone is, but the more extensive introductions prior to each presentation. So as I mentioned previously, we are very pleased to have four speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Reynaldo Holder, who is currently the International PAHO Consultant for Health Systems Strengthening at PAHO. Our second speaker will be Dr. Jillian Bartlett, who is the Senior Medical Officer at the Ministry of Health for the Government of the Bahamas, followed by Dr. Laura J. Espri, the Director of Primary Health Care at the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and New Health Investment of the Government of the Commonwealth of Dominica. And finally, we have, um, sorry, I lost my second page, Dr. Jacqueline B. Sassour, Mackenzie, who is the Chief Medical Officer in the Ministry of Health for the Government of Jamaica. So without further ado, I'm going to begin with the introduction for Dr. Reynaldo Holder. Dr. Holder is a Panamanian pediatrician with 38 years of national and international experience in the health system. He holds a master's degree in health services management, and he was formerly the Regional Advisor for Integrated Health Services in PAHO. After 17 years with the organization, he recently retired in 2017, and since he has been engaged as an international public consultant. We are very pleased to have Dr. Holder with us today. He has been assisting us in the COVID-19 response from the Pan American Health Organization. So, Dr. Holder, I'm going to give you presenter privileges so that you can go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you, Anela. Okay, are you able to see my desktop? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, it's very uh, a great pleasure to be here and to be able to be a participant in this event. Uh, reviewing the list of participants, I see a lot of the I see a lot of names of people I know and I've been uh, working with for quite some time, and we have shared some of the experiences and some of the challenges as we go responding to this uh, pandemic emergency. Today I've been asked to uh, present, introduce briefly the guidelines to strengthen the first level of care 
within the framework of primary health care and universal health in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. At, at PAHO in HSS, uh, when we, we, we speak of primary health care, we refer to an approach to analysis, organization, and management of health systems that goes beyond the first level of care to look at the system from approach that put people first, that is based on the right to health, equity, and solidarity for all people, and that uh, insists uh, or focuses on uh, throughout the, the, the analysis of the, the determinants of health, the levels of inequity and inequality in society, uh, promotes health through different actions and interventions to ensure that people enjoy good health, quality of life, and well-being. And this approach is an integrated approach that focuses not only on management of disease, in this particular case of COVID, but in looking at all the, 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 the determinants and, and different approaches that are necessary to uh, ensure uh, the health of the population, the health of individuals, and produce quality services and ensure well-being. And that approach is much wider than the health services, as you can see by the slide. It takes into account the social protection issues, determinants of health, the needs for health in all policies, of health in all policies, and of course, uh, a strong emphasis on health promotion and universal health. In that respect, it's very important to, to remember as we continue to battle with this emergency that it needs a multi-sectoral uh, approach, it needs a multi-sectoral coordination with other areas of government and society who, who play an important role in not only human development, but also in the health and well-being of populations. So our, our approach from HSS to this pandemic does not focus exclusively on hospitals, ventilators, et cetera, which are very important in managing uh, the patients that become uh, ill and complicated, but also uh, focuses on the overall uh, determinants of health and the factors that will ensure that we can uh, protect the population, reduce the transmission, uh, and continue to provide quality care for those who require it. So, from that perspective, uh, and looking at the health services in response to this emergency, what are we facing? What are we facing at this moment that we have been facing for the last uh, few months? It's a pandemic, it's a very large event, uh, magnitude and, and significance that is affecting the world. Very few countries uh, have not had uh, increased number of cases. Very few countries uh, have been um, are not, are not in this phase of the pandemic in uh, community transmission. Most of the countries are already experiencing community transmission, and the event uh, is not a, in, no, in no way close to be under control. So it continues to be uh, of, a, of a very large magnitude and affects worldwide and, for, and ends to the, the, the denomination of a pandemic. In the response, we're consuming large amounts of resources, not only for health, but for in, in other instances of, of government and society. Uh, this this uh, emergency situation has uh, obliged countries to move resources that were previously uh, set aside for other developmental issues to health and to ensure that we protect the population. And it affects, of course, the performance of the entire health system, not only hospitals, and also the entire society. So we're looking at increased demand for healthcare services. We're looking at limited or insufficient resources. We're looking at uh, high social and political pressure in, in many countries. Uh, some of you may have heard news of uh, ministers of health in many countries resigning or being removed because of the situation uh, uh, and the, 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 the great scrutiny over their performance. And what is worrying us all very much, we're looking at increased mortality numbers worldwide. 
So more than, than only a health impact, we're faced with a very strong social impact. And our capacity to respond and control the, the, the pandemic uh, from the health point of view is very important in, uh, in establishing what would be the, 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 the future and the well-being of our societies. And even uh, after we, we, we are able to control it from the health perspective, of course, there will be important other issues in the, in, econ in the economies and, and, the, and the organization of our societies that will be impacted for quite some time after the pandemic. So in health services and the health systems, we're focusing mainly on saving lives. In responding to, demand, uh, to the demand for, uh, for services during the pandemic, and with this uh, focus on saving lives, the, the system depends on leadership and the response capacity of the entire health system and the organization of all levels of health services and the involvement of organizations, social organizations, and all actors in society to be able to, do, to give a, a, an effective response. The objectives of the response is controlling transmission, and for that we have important, an important role to be played by the first level of care, and also in managing the severe cases that reach the hospitals and that require uh, care for critical conditions and also um, mechanisms to contain, the, uh, public health mechanisms to contain the spread of the, the pandemic outside of these institutions. For that, the, the response needs to focus on a comprehensive and participatory approach that includes the health services, community organizations, and intersectoral actors, but also that has a strong public health uh, perspective that uses health promotion mechanisms and, and, and knowledge to uh, help organize and prevent uh, the spread of the disease and organize the populations for them to follow uh, the, the containment uh, behaviors that are required to control this, this pandemic. And of course, the capacity to provide appropriate care to those patients who require it. But it also, in, 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 it also demands an integrated approach from all levels of the health services, the public and the private health services under the steering role uh, of the ministries of health, the national health authorities, and it demands a rational, efficient, and integrated use of all the resources in a national health system. So as you can see, uh, in, in many instances at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of focus was put on hospitals and getting ready for ventilators. And even in, in some countries, some uh, facilities have been uh, built and organized around the provision of intensive care. However, the, the experience is proving that the overall response of the health services, the first level of care, and specialized care, hospital services, and other services within the, the system, which requires and have an important role to play in the continuum. So for that, we need to strengthen the resolute capacity of the first level of care to respond to COVID-19 and guarantee essential services that would not be able to be provided at hospital levels. This uh, becomes a challenge for many countries in which the, the first level of care has for some time uh, struggled with uh, continuing to provide services with very low resources. And uh, in certain, thank God, a, a few few uh, countries, the, even the, the abandonment of the first level of care in, uh, in situations where uh, resources, especially financial resources, are being scarce to uh, strengthen the first level of care and give it the capacity to really play the role that it can play in, health, in modern health systems. We also need to, to maintain, and, and that is important to, to, to underline, that we're not saying to definance hospital services or to put hospital services. We, we, are, we are proposing the need to maintain a balance of resources allocated to, those, to all levels of, of services, uh, but in particular to, to continue the strengthening of the first level of care that can play an important role, as you can see in the, in the, in the boxes on, the, the, on this slide, in uh, many instances of the uh, provision of services, the identification of cases, and the control of cases in the communities. 
and the need to expand and maintain services for particular groups, vulnerable groups, the poor, uh, in the population in rural areas, the indigenous population in many of our Latin American countries, and uh, very, urban, very urban areas where uh, people live in conditions of poverty and uh, in, 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 with very scarce resources. In, in trying to provide guidance to our member states, in particular, particularly in responding at the health services level, we have produced, HSS has produced uh, uh, some important publications that we hope uh, present recommendations that are helping the countries to move forward. The first publication was presented on March, in March 2020 for the reorganization and progressive expansion of the health services in response to the COVID pandemic. The purpose of this publication was to uh, offer recommendations to strengthen the response of the overall response of the health services uh, with a, a look at saving lives and ensuring uh, effective response throughout the system by reorganizing uh, the expansion of health services that will be required to respond to the increased demand for health services. And we presented their 10 recommendations that you have on the right of your screen. Uh, number one recommendation was of course, to strengthen the first level of care in the initial response to the pandemic in many countries, and in, uh, particularly in, in Europe, in Spain, and Italy, the response was focused exclusively on hospitals, and we have learned a lot from that, and we have learned uh, that it's important to look at the overall health systems and the services at all its level to uh, be able to organize an effective response. So. First and foremost, the recommendation is, a rec is to reorganize and strengthen the response capacity of the first level of care. Uh, in the, the other nine uh, recommendations, those are, those are highlighted, uh, require also, are also part of this reorganization and strengthening and requires uh, changes that uh, are not only exclusively for first level of care, but for for all health services, but are part, are part of that strengthening the capacity of the health services and using the first level of care effectively in the response. In May, uh, HSS put forward the framework for the response of integrated health service delivery networks. This response is focused specifically now on health services and uh, is thought to for, for countries who have made the decision and the de determination to move forward in reorganizing their health services to achieve integrated health service delivery, which is an agreement of all the member states of the Pan American Health Organization. And, and many of the countries have, uh, have significant uh, advance, advancements in reorganizing their services based on the framework of integrated health service delivery network that was approved by the governing bodies of the Pan American Health Organization in 2009. And what we did with this provocation was to actually look at the 14 attributes of the integrated health service delivery networks and establish or make recommendations for essential actions and intervention at each level or at each attribute that could be, uh, could be put in place rapidly to strengthen the capacity of the overall health services to respond to the emergency. And this uh, document was this document was uh, distributed, as I said before, in May. In response to the to, to recommendations and, and, and demands from member states, uh, we continue to look at experiences not only in in Europe and in China, but also to look at, at, at experiences that already were being uh, generated in the Americas, uh, the early lessons that were coming from countries that were, effect, were affected very early in uh, the pandemic. And uh, it led to the, the design of this technical note that was sent to the countries on the 23rd of April 2020. The objective of the technical note was to give specific recommendations on the role of the first level of care during the COVID-19. It's based, as I said before, an observation of the experience in other countries, 
in China, uh, for instance, where there are an extensive uh, extensive activity was done at the community level, uh, door to door, working with community organizations, working with first level of care providers and uh, and community leaders to actually increase the, the, the social distancing, the hand washing, uh, the understanding of the need for hand washing, understanding of the need for using masks, and uh, the overall uh, knowledge of the population in regards to how to conduct themselves, how to uh, uh, achieve a disciplined approach towards uh, controlling the, the pandemic. And the function of during uh, this document, as we said before, that during it, this, it was uh, tailored to the phase of community transmission, sustained community transmission. And in that sense, we uh, made recommendations for the first level of care in three specific functions. One, focusing on the response to COVID-19 and building the capacity of the first level of care teams to identify, report, contain, manage, and refer patients that, were, uh, that would require hospital care. Second, uh, we established or presented recommendations of how to continue essential services for those patients who are not COVID-19 but require continuous care uh, at the first level of care for uh, their, their, their health conditions. And this was mostly for patients with chronic conditions such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, patients with uh, mental issues, mental health uh, conditions who required continued care uh, through the essential services and who required, who required also um, medication, surveillance, and, uh, and, and preventive actions despite the, 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 the quarantine situation that most of the countries uh, were going through, those services need to, needed to be uh, to be provided on a continuous basis. And the third set of recommendations were uh, to how to strengthen the capacity of the first level of care to reduce unnecessary demand on hospitals, how to strengthen the capacity of health centers, of polyclinics, to deal with situations that could avoid going to emergency rooms in hospitals so as to uh, uh, protect the hospitals from increased uh, demand that could affect their capacity to respond effectively to COVID-19. So with these, these recommendations, uh, HSS, Health Systems and Services Training, uh, and PAHO has tried to provide a measure of recommendations and orientations to countries on what has been a, a very uh, rewarding uh, experience for us is to see how our member states have used these recommendations to improve uh, their response, and we'll, we'll be able to see a clear of those experiences now, and how even uh, the member states, most, mostly the member states have produced uh, lessons learned that are now part of the recommendations that we're making as to good practices in response to the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, the challenges remain. Uh, for us, uh, the challenge continues to be how we provide the technological resources to the first level of care for effective implementation of new modalities of care in response, not only to COVID, but also in providing essential services for patient, for non-COVID patients who require continuous care. How to ensure mechanisms for effective coordination, communication, and linkages throughout the service network to ensure response of the healthcare needs, responses to the healthcare needs of the population. And these responses, are, as I have said throughout the presentation, are not only uh, health, but are multi-sectoral. And how to ensure that health workers at the first level of care have safe conditions, the necessary protection, care for their needs and incentives to provide services to communities and vulnerable population. We find that it's very important to take care of our people. Uh, we must provide care for the communities, but also for those healthcare providers who every day go out and uh, put themselves at risk to provide care for individuals, families, and communities in order to, to guarantee continuation 
continuity of care, and an effective response to the emergency. And as, as in by saying, uh, we need to continue using our face masks, we need to continue promoting hand washing and social distancing, but I surely um, miss seeing the smiles of children. As, I, as you heard in my bio data, I'm a pediatrician, and one of the most rewarding experiences is to see smiling faces on little ones and, and children. And we need to put all our effort and our work in ensuring that the response of, in our countries lead to uh, a time when our children and, our, and us will, will not have to walk around every day with masks and we'll all be able to smile again. That's part of our great responsibility in providing health and well-being to the communities. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Back to you, Anela. Thank you very much, Reynaldo, uh, for that excellent presentation and uh, introduction to our webinar today, to our topic for our webinar today. Um, I, um, your last slide made me smile, so I just wanted to send a smile to everybody because um, it really did make me smile. And and like you, I miss the smiles of children and of everyone. So um, it was very poignant. Um, so with that. Uh, we will now move to our next speaker. Sorry, I accidentally closed my mic. Um, we will move to our next speaker, whom I would like to introduce, uh, but also I need to upload the presentation. So if you just bear with me one moment, I will first upload the presentation and then I will introduce. Okay, just a moment, because I had to change the presentation. Next slide. Okay, one moment. Okay, while that is uploading, I will go ahead and introduce our next speaker. So I'm pleased to tell you that our next speaker is Dr. Jillian Leslie-Ann Neely Bartlett. Dr. Bartlett is the Senior Medical Officer at the Ministry of Health for the Government of the Bahamas. Uh, Dr. Bartlett is a former graduate of the University of the West Indies uh, Trinidad campus in St. Augustine. Um, and has been employed with the Ministry of Health since January 1999. Dr. Bartlett has worked in many of the government clinics in New Providence and Family Island, I, excuse me, Island, uh, and is proud to say that she is married to Reverend Hugh Bartlett, Jr., and that they have two sons. So with that, we are most pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Bartlett. Dr. Bartlett, I am going to make you a panelist, but as agreed, I will go ahead and manage the slides for you, but I think it will be easier. Sorry, I lost. We're well over 100 people now, and so <laughs> it was much easier to find the names. Okay, now I can. Okay, so let me make you a panelist and your mic should open. Um, and uh, please confirm that you would like me to manage the slides or if you would prefer to do so yourself. Yes, good afternoon, Anella. You may manage the slides for me, please. Okay, perfect. Just let me know when to change them. All right, so good afternoon, all. Um, presentation this afternoon is on COVID-19, the primary health care experience in the Bahamas. Next slide, please. Okay. 
Okay. Um, Manila, the next slide, please. Did we not change the slide? Oh, no, this, no. oh, I just realized why, sorry. I needed to become presenter again. <laughs> okay, you should be seeing it now, please confirm. Yes, yes, I am seeing it now. Thank you, Anello. Thank you. So I'll continue. So Bahamas is an archipelago that is made up of over 700 islands and keys, of which approximately 30 are inhabited. Our primary health care services consist of the public and private health sectors. The primary health care services have to be duplicated, and the goal is to ensure that the services are the same across all islands and keys. Next slide, please, Anello. The outline of my presentation this afternoon would be as follows. Communication, preparation, implementation, response, outcomes, and challenges. Next slide, please. So in our first strategy was one of communication. Communication allows us to do just that, talk to the healthcare providers to get them to buy in to what we need them to do. Next slide, please. Some of the key components of our communication strategy, because not all of our primary healthcare providers have a strong background in public health, so we had to first educate them as to what is a pandemic. We also wanted them to appreciate the operation of the healthcare facility to ensure safety of both the healthcare providers and the clients. We also advise them of the signs and symptoms of a suspected case of coronavirus and what is the expectation of not only the healthcare facility but the providers should a case of COVID-19 present. And also that to make sure that they enhance the public health measures to be taken, such as the wearing of masks, hand washing, and proper social distancing. Next slide, please. So once we were able to communicate that across the Bahamas, then we went into our preparation phase. Next slide, please. The key focus of our preparation phase was in training of all healthcare staff, and that being clinical staff and support staff from the maid, housekeeper, straight up to the physician. We also put in place protocols that emphasize triaging, isolation, and treatment. We also established a call center that operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This call center was staffed with primary healthcare clinicians and the nurses, providers, healthcare providers, and their job was to field calls from the general public who would call in with questions about COVID-19, and if they were having any signs of symptoms, they were triage virtually and then refer to the appropriate healthcare institution for further management and treatment. Also, we did an establishment of a mobile assessment unit that, not because we in 2020, we realized that some of our population may not be as technologically savvy. So we had to reach out to our, to those set of population as well as our vulnerable populations. So this mobile unit was able to go into homes that are not readily accessible to make quick assessments and do the necessary and appropriate referrals. We also engaged an air evacuation service so that our clients from our family islands and keys can also be brought into new providence for the appropriate tertiary care. Next slide, please. This is just a picture of one of our polyclinics where we were setting up for the triaging of COVID-19 in preparation for the onslaught of COVID-19. Next slide, please. After preparation, we went into our implementation phase. Next slide, please. And the implementation was comprehensive. We had to have a comprehensive approach. 
So in New Providence, we develop a call center in the mobile unit, which I just spoke about, and it was fully implemented in March of 2020. And in our family of islands, we develop local health care committees with various stakeholders that were able to come together to come back and to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in their communities. This also enabled us to replicate services on our major family islands and keys. And because our borders are very porous, we also had to develop strong relationships with our Border Patrol partners, that is, Immigration and the Customs Department. Next slide, please. So what was our response? After putting that all in place, what did we do here in the Bahamas? Next slide, please. We had to suspend some of our primary health care services, mainly the maternal and child health. We also focused mainly on clients with signs and symptoms of COVID-19 for rapid identification, isolation, and treatment. So the presented with the signs of symptoms of COVID-19 at any one of our primary health care facilities. They were triaged on the outside by the healthcare workers who wore the appropriate PPEs. They were taken to an identified isolation room at a healthcare facility, assessed by our healthcare providers to determine the level of illness, whether mild, moderate, or severe. Our surveillance units would notify in each case for follow-up and most importantly, for contact tracing, for contact tracing, sorry. Treatment was then rendered where mild cases were self-isolated at home where appropriate, moderately and severely ill clients were referred to a tertiary care institution for further management and investigation. Especially in our family islands, they were evacuated using the protocols and ISO port to bring them into new providence for their further management and investigation. Next slide, please. Our second action plan two was that the non-COVID, the non-cases, sorry, were self-quarantined at home or in a government facility. And one of our primary health care facilities had to be retrofitted in anticipation of the search. And also, one of our poly health clinics here in New Providence was also opened on weekends to accommodate those non-COVID related health matters. Next slide, please. After putting all of this in place, what were our outcomes here in the Bahamas? Next slide, please. Some of our outcomes here was that our first case was diagnosed of COVID-19 on Monday, March 16, 2020. We have a total of 104 cases to date of 11 deaths. There's no community spread of COVID-19 in the Bahamas, only cluster and sporadic cases. Two of our islands outside of New Providence recorded cases, and that is Gran Bahama and Bimini. To date, we have no new cases for the past 15 days in New Providence, 54 days in Gran Bahama, and 44 days in the island of Bimini. So our other family islands in the archipelago remain COVID-free. Next slide, please. Challenges that we are facing here. Our current challenge is in establishing our regular primary healthcare services, getting back to normal. If we have temporarily lost one of our major healthcare facilities that was retrofitted in anticipation of the surge of COVID-19. So we have a displaced population that is now underserved, and this has the potential effect on our immunization coverage. And the last thing we'd want to see in the Bahamas is we got through COVID-19, okay, and then we are now faced with community spread of vaccine preventable diseases. So our aim here is to get back to normal as quickly as we can. Another challenge is finding alternative, alternative sites to render primary healthcare services. So in that vein, I want to thank you for your attention. And everybody have a good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Bartlett, for that very informative presentation. And it was really quite interesting to listen to 
when you went through the various steps of communication, preparation, implementation, response, and then of course the outcomes and the current challenges. I think this will be uh, food for much discussion uh, after we listen to the upcoming presentations. So with that, um, if you give me one moment, I'm going to go ahead and upload the next slide. And Dr. Bartlett, if you'd like to close your microphone, and I will upload the next presentation. Okay, so before we get, begin, let me go ahead and give panelists privileges to our next speaker. And first, uh, I will introduce our next speaker. So, our next speaker is Dr. Laura J. Esprit. Uh, Dr. Esprit, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, is the Director of Primary Health Care for the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and New Health Investment of the Government of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Uh, Dr. Spree is a medical doctor currently employed by the government in Dominica and holds the position of Director of Primary Health Care Services since 2015. Uh, she is also the Health Disaster Coordinator for the Ministry and assumes responsibilities as Chair of the Health National Emergency Planning Organization Subcommittee and as focal point for the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Diabetic Retinopathy Screening and Treatment Program, among others. Dr. Esprit holds a Master's of Public Health degree with a focus on primary health care services from the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus in Barbados uh, from 2013, as well as a medical degree from uh, the Che Guevara Faculty of Medical Sciences in Canada, Cuba. Uh, Dr. Esprit recently pursued a certification in diabetic wound care management. This came as a result of clinical complications suffered by diabetes seen in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and is also driven by her passion to care for forgotten clients struck with non-healing chronic wounds. She provides at least one to two weekly clinics to, clinics to clients free of cost. Uh, she's also filled in as Chief Medical Officer and Permanent Secretary and is currently the Interim Permanent Se Secretary acting uh, for Dominica. Um, in May 2020, she received an award from the Dominica Broadcasting Corporation for her leadership in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic as head of the Contact Tracing and Sample Collection Committee and Director of Primary Health Care Services. She also received a Public Service Innovation Award nomination in 2018 uh, with a Certificate of Excellence for the first health awareness campaign in the country. So without further ado, uh, we are extremely pleased to have um, Dr. Esprit here with us. And if you bear with me, I will now give you the privileges to And my apologies. I am not finding the name.
Dr. Spree, could you kindly raise your hand in the room so that I can find <laughs> your name because I'm unfortunately not locating and it's possible that it's under a different Oh, there it is. Okay, I just found it. Okay, I'm now going to give you panelists privileges and as I understand, you would like me to manage the slides similar to the previous speaker. So welcome again, Dr. Spree, and thank you so Can you hear me? Perfectly, thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Um, can you change? I cannot yet see my presentation. Oh, I apologize. I think I may have uploaded. Okay, just one moment. Okay. <laughs> you want to close your mic and mute your Uh, Dr. Spree, I apologize. <laughs> okay, I do now see. It. I was not. I was not able to download it easily because of technicality. Okay. But I am now going to download it and then I will upload it. So bear with me. You may need to close. You may need to close your microphone in the intro. And this is now your presentation. Yes. Right. Okay, I could see it now. So, so can I start? Yes, please. Let me say good afternoon to, to the, the Power team, Ethan and, and Barbados. And to the panelists, Dr. Holder, I'm lovely hearing from you and of course the participants. Thank you for the opportunity. As I will be presenting on response, primary healthcare response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As you know, my name is Next slide, please. So let me welcome you to the Nature Island of the Caribbean. Uh, I invite the team to, to, to visit our wonderful site. We'd like to visit to 365 rivers and, of course, home to the Pahu to Dr. Etienne. This is where the arrow is. This is where a small island is. Next slide, please. Objective. I just follow basically the focus will be placed on number one as it relates to the services focus on the COVID 19 as well in terms of identity and referrals. 
Next slide. Right, so this is just a bit of background um, in terms of Dominica. You'll find here our population pyramid, what it looks like. And, and um, of course, we, we bear a small population of just about 71,000 persons. Next slide. Primary health care services is actually in Dominica by offering a package of of flagship programs, and this um, is divided into two administrative regions: health information, health information at our at our main hospital in the, in the capital. Alongside, you will also see the composition of of the staff in in primary health care division, uh, which amounts to almost 200 persons. Is dominated by our our nurses and our foot soldiers, who are our community health aides. Next slide. With the advent of the of the pandemic, Dominica has attempted to take the steps, the all of the protocols and guidelines of representation of the World Health Organization and the PAHO in other response to, to what has happened or what is happening locally. So you will see the WHO announcements and of course Dominica's Okay. Um, the map will you'll appreciate the location of all confirmed cases. And in the dashboard you will see that we have 18 confirmed cases on island, or we had, with an age range of 18 years, median age 52, and zero deaths, fortunately. Um, more than 800 persons being tested thus far. Almost 90 days since our last confirmed case. Next slide. This is the framework that we based on response to, to the COVID pandemic. Um, primary health care was thoroughly engaged in all committees, as you can see at the bottom. Um, you had a human resource management of unit surveillance testing. So primary health care was integral to these areas, but very participated in the contact tracing and sampling collection committee. Next slide. So these are the various avenues that we use for contact tracing and, and early detection. So you'll see um, quite a bit of, of, of approaches that we took in order to, to really cover all of our bases. Next slide. So the sample, the, the, the committee as a matter of fact was we, we subdivided ourselves into into three basically we had the the administrative team up, up on top the administrative team that would actually provide direction to the mobile assessment team and the mobile assessment team now they would provide that search capacity that would be required to support the various districts remembering that i said that there are seven health districts in dominica so they were pretty much available 24 hours a day, always ready to go. And that group was no smaller or minimum of, of three people. And I will later tell you the composition of, of that team. Next slide. Here you can appreciate the emergency operating center that we, that we set up for both strategic and our operational teams. So it's quite busy in there. Next slide. As it relates to identifying and monitoring our, our clients, particularly the older ones, what we did before the actual outbreak, though, we ensured that we had done our home and household visits, paying attention to our shortings or elderly, ensure that the, the chronic disease clinics were, were conducted to the full, our registers were looked at and reviewed, and various shots were given in terms of immunization. Now, during the outbreak now, what we had, we had a staff at our, our COVID hotline team, and um, essentially that was run 24 hours a day, 
in an effort to prevent persons who potentially had COVID from coming to the health facility. So these are the considerations that we took, especially in light of our having quite a bit of our, our older persons who would suffer from chronic diseases. Next slide. So this is the protocol that we, we use for reporting. Essentially, um, after being swabbed, your, 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 your specimen would be sent to the, to the lab located at the Princess Margaret Hospital. Um, within a 24-48 hour period, then results would be received and sent directly from the lab superintendent across to the national epidemiologist. He too would communicate the information with our chief medical officer, Akin, who would later relay that information to the director of primary health care services. In turn, the district would be informed, and of course, the clients would be told of their results, be it positive or, or negative, and then would have the process of quarantine or transfer to isolation units. Next slide. So the diagnosis of we, we've developed certain protocols. Um, for example, we we used the, the surveillance case definition from WHO that was adopted in addition to various national case reporting forms, court health forms. Even self-reporting was very useful. We had persons reporting of just having lost um, the sense of taste and smell and they were actually diagnosed with COVID. And of course, we have here the use of our rapid test and PCR as our gold standard. Next, please. In an effort to contain the, the transmission and spread of the disease, we tried to enforce the, the 14 day mandatory quarantine for persons coming in, as well as the immediate isolation of COVID positive patients. As it relates to the establishment of the committee that I spoke about, we adopted a very aggressive approach to, to tracing these ones. And they, they, they use various categories of staff, but the integration of our community health aids were very critical to our team. In so doing, we had to shut down what we consider to be non-essential services, all in an effort to redirect staff to have them focus on what was more critical at the time. There you will see we, we observe various protocols um, as it relates to public health measures. We had a lot of press briefings to inform the public as to what to do, not to do, and general information. But the multi-sectoral collaboration was, was, was really something to talk about. We had the support of PAHO in terms of technical cooperation. The team was here. I remember Dr. Myrna Charles was here doing various types of training with us, infection um, control workshops, etc. But generally speaking, that collaboration was here locally and internationally, it was certainly felt. And definitely we had the support and commitment of the cabinet ensure that, to ensure that all we needed was available. Next slide. Here you will see a picture of the PAHO sponsored CHA community health aid program that started in 2018. And that was also critical to our response. You can move along, next slide. So in terms of communication on the guidance of public health measures, these are what we looked at, but obviously we had to start with, with training our staff. That was very critical, the dunning, dubbing, what to do, what not to do, the right information to, to give to the teams. Even when we had IEC material, strategically placing it in, in, in public places, in businesses, et cetera. Um, we had special measures. Um, adopted for the care of the elderly, especially in private homes, would make some recommendations to them. But I really want to pause here a bit on stigmatization. That was an area that we never give consideration to in our planning. And we thought that was very critical. I actually had the opportunity to sit in with the psychiatrist on a session with a patient who was diagnosed with COVID. And then I thought, hmm, why not do a reenactment? So on May 1st, in a national press briefing, briefing um, um, the director did a reenactment of stigmatization um, from the client's perspective, um, who were in a minority, 16 at the time, but they actually felt discriminated. So that press briefing was entitled, or the story I gave was entitled, Laura's Story of Case Number 16. Moving along. As it relates to management uh, of COVID-19, we looked at this with an all uh, hands-on approach. We definitely had to reall reallocate the, the staff that we had, 
sent to, to quarantine or isolation unit or to provide the, the, the home monitoring for, for clients there. Um, we had such capacity both locally, yes, but also from particularly from, from Cuba in terms of nurses, doctors, lab technicians. We had to look at, at our structure. We needed backup buildings or equipment and various types of supplies. Of course, looking at effective medical treatment and incorporating the psychosocial support to it. But the actual focus, this was done with quickly identifying patients, testing, transferring, isolating them, and treating them. And of course, they would have had continuous monitoring at home as per protocol. Next slide, here you will see the arrival of our Cuban counterparts to provide the support to our national response. Next slide, as it relates to triaging cases or potential contact, this is just a bit of a flow chart so you could see. A patient is sick at home, they would call the hotline. Here we would have, here we actually hired a staff with medical experience to help in the virtual triaging of the calls. Later on, this would be transferred to the district medical officer, however, with the view of not having patients come to the health center. We would then, um, would then use various forms of telemedicine to basically screen, again, triaging the, the patients and what types of symptoms that they present. If there was a need, we would go to the home, the various temperature screenings, get the swab done, and of course, have the, the, the families quarantined until we have the, the lab results. Next slide, please. So if the patient were, for some, um, were to, to, to come to the facility for some reason, again, the, here you would say have the COVID-19 flyers, meaning that ongoing patient um, education, building awareness, that would be an ongoing procedure. But in addition to that, though, we would encourage um, persons to make medical appointment, and that's the first time that we've done it in primary health care before having the appointments to encourage physical distancing, to ensure that they use their masks and other measures that were deemed necessary. Next slide. Here you will see a picture of the, the government operated um, facilities that we, we are using, was using, in addition to the isolation units, both in the capital and the northern part of the island. Next slide. Here you will see the pathway used for referring of clients, whether they came through the ports of entry or whether they presented with symptoms at home. Next slide. As it relates to maintaining our essential primary health care services, initially we had to adopt a scaled down approach, but our critical services continued with a lot of caution and a lot of dedication. Some services were provided on an emergency basis but certainly we continued the, the, the referral systems that we had, for example, for emergencies, for dialysis, and even victims of abuse. So that continued, but very strategically. Next slide. Special, next, wait. So special considerations were definitely given. Um, if the person comes to the or patient accesses the healthcare services in terms of where they sit, how they sit, the use of masks, ventilation of the facilities, but critically here is the appointment system, and it has been working beautifully, and that is one of the, the highlights that we hope to continue in primary health care services, both for medical services and lab services as well. Next slide. In terms of surveillance system, we had the opportunity to have um, community testing done at the district level. Um, that's across all health districts with approximately 1,428 persons being tested uh, or 600 households, and there is no evidence of community spread of the virus. And here you will see our teams here, public health nurses, district medical officer, alongside a patient posing for a picture. But um, as it stands now, the, all our health centers are, are open. Primary health care has returned to, to normal, bearing in mind that COVID will be with us for a while. It's a pandemic and not a, an epidemic. We continue to monitor all our sites. But the fear that we have, though, is, is that of complacency. As um, persons say, um, 
you know, the, the, the curve has flattened. We're now considering reopening of borders. Today is the last day for the for the curfew, and then it officially ends. So that is really our fear, fear of complacency. Next, next slide, please. And here you see the composition of our mobile team. There was no less than three persons being grouped up. You would have the district medical officer or the family nurse practitioner who engages in the actual swabbing. Another person, likely the PHA, in terms of documentation, and another person for staff welfare. We thought that was very, very, very critical. Just reminders, yes, the staff would have gotten the training of donning and doffing, but just to ensure, reminders to make sure that it is done properly. So that is really a supportive approach. And I end with the last slide saying um, thank you to the to primary health care teams in Dominica, to the Ministry of Health, to the Cabinet, and of course to the assistance of, of PAHO. We look towards your, your continued support and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, very, very well thought out and very impressive. Very impressive. And uh, yes, we hope that it remains like we understand your enough comments about the challenge of complacency, like the challenge everywhere. Without further ado, again, uh, I'd like to close your mic. Go ahead and introduce our. Next speaker. Please. I don't know what to put. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. I'm going to just go down to the attendee, and then you will be able to close it maybe more easily. If you want to try. I hope I close this. And I can close it. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, and when you're a panelist, I cannot. So uh, thank you again. And I do believe I had originally put up the wrong presentation. So I think this is our last presentation. Um, so just one moment, and I'm going to introduce our final speaker before we move to questions and discussion. And I must say, uh, I'm already formulating some questions in my own mind, but uh, we will leave that for later. Uh, so our last speaker is Dr. Jacqueline Bisasor McKenzie. Uh, Dr. Bisasor McKenzie is the Chief Medical Officer in the Ministry of Health in the Government of Jamaica. Uh, Dr. Bisasor McKenzie has 25 years of experience in the healthcare system in Jamaica and was the first emergency physician to be appointed as a consultant in the public sector. She served as the head of the accident and emergency department at the Spanish Town Hospital from 2005 to 2014 until she joined the ministry as the director of emergency medical services. She later assumed the role of principal medical officer and director of emergency disaster management and special services in August 2016. And her recent work at the ministry includes reducing waiting time in emergency departments and improving patient flow and increasing, which has, I'm sorry, which has resulted in improved patient flow as well as increased capacity at health centers. Uh, she completed her Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Medicine in Surgery and Master's of Degree of Public Health and Doctor of Medicine in Emergency Medicine at the University of the West Indies. Um, She's a member of the Caribbean Health Disaster Coordinators Committee, a board member of the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, and has also served as the president of the Jamaica Emergency Medicine Association. So we are very pleased to have our last speaker with us, uh, Dr. Bisasur McKenzie. So just one moment, and I'm going to go ahead and I believe this is the correct. Okay, uh, Dr. McKenzie, I think I gave you privileges to be panelists. If you could please let us know. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, perfect. Okay. And is this the correct presentation? Yes, it is. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Go ahead and start whenever you're ready. 
So I would like to be able to move this slide. Oh, okay, perfect. I will give you the presenter privileges then. Um, and then I'll just ask that you return those privileges or I can take them back when we're done. So you should be able to move your own slides now. If you want to go ahead and try, there should be a arrow at the top of the screen and you just move that arrow to the right. No, I'm not, I'm not seeing the arrow. Huh, okay. You do see your presentation on the screen? I do see the presentation. Okay, right above that, directly in the center. Oh, okay. It's like a play button. <laughs> right. Okay. okay, good. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to thank Paho for giving, giving uh, me the opportunity to present on behalf of Jamaica. I want to say a special thank you to the Paho Jamaica team that has been very supportive to the Minister of Health and is our constant, um, constant guide right at our side. Um, I, and I want to say thank you to the presenters who have presented before very informative presentation. So I'll just go straight into my presentation. Um, so in looking at primary health care, primary health care is a whole of society approach to health and well-being centered on the needs and preference of individuals, families, and communities. It addresses the broader determinants of health and focuses on the comprehensive and interrelated aspects of physical, mental, and social health and well-being. So essentially, our journey with COVID has really been a primary health care journey that we have looked at the primary health care needs which essentially have been addressing COVID-19 infection in individuals and preventing COVID-19 infections from occurring. In a situation where somebody had mentioned that difficult to manage when the majority of your infected persons are either asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms, but we have been moving along the wheels of access, ensuring that there's access ensuring that there's public participation using health promotion and technology. And certainly with our intersectoral partners, there has been a great cooperation between different agencies in order to fight COVID-19 in Jamaica. For the health, for the health ministry, our plan for COVID, the way that we have approached the management of COVID, has focused on all the primary health care elements that have been blended into our five pronged strategic approach in our pandemic plan. And so this includes planning and coordination, prevention and containment, situation monitoring and assessment, or health system response, and of course, communication. In terms, and I'm just gonna go through what we have done in each of these areas very briefly to provide the overall response. <clears throat> in terms of planning and coordination, working emergency operation centers at all levels have been very, very essential to, to what we're doing in terms of the communication and the coordination of activities at all levels. And one of our goals have been trying to get these centers right across the country to be appropriately equipped and for us to be in constant communication. Our communications between our parishes, our regions, and the central ministry have been key in terms of our response, in terms of our building that camaraderie. We have used all kinds of different measures to keep in contact, including WhatsApp groups, Zoom meetings. Um, we're constantly on the ground. The central team is really has been integrated into working with the parishes and the regions, and this really has been the strength of our response, that overall coordination. 
not only within the health sector and within the health ministry, but our intersectoral national emergency operations center has also provided that intersectoral approach because we have had to we have had to work with labor and labor and social security as well as well as national um, security and several other agencies in order to be able to have a coordinated response. We have also had um, the COVID-19 subcommittee of cabinet, where from the government from, from the government level, we have been very integrated in the overall planning and um, phasing of our approach, and this has really been integral in ensuring that the health sector is appropriately guiding the process. We have also had participation in the parliamentary subcommittee that brings in government and opposition ministers to ensure that we have a full understanding right across all borders in the country. With regard to prevention and containment, um, our prevention and containment started very early. And um, we started, of course, with restrictions at our borders on January the 30th, January 31st, with where we had first issued the travel, travel restrictions on China. And with that came a lot of work, I think, um, some of it being done for the first time by many, many persons within the health system, where we had to establish quarantine stations, um, places, for isolating persons that we had to rapidly, within the space of days, put together new quarantine facilities. We had situations where we had to go into communities to broach the subject of opening up a quarantine facility within a community. And that came with a lot of excitement, a lot of stigma associated with managing COVID at that time in January. Um, but that was pretty much our first our first approach in terms of containment where we established these quarantine facilities that all persons that were returning from China who were Jamaican nationals were placed in a quarantine facility, isolated if they became symptomatic. With the, with the detection of our first confirmed case, an uh, uh, imported case, we moved into another realm in terms of the isolation of confirmed cases. And we had to not only have facilities within hospitals, but also state facilities and approach the isolation and quarantine in home. And this was a new area again for us in terms of having establishing um, home isolation and having that discussion with persons, having the support from the public health team the staffing of the state facilities, um, the establishment of facilities within hospital right across the country, we established isolation facilities and moved to establish COVID wards. Then when we moved towards um, our community quarantine, when we started to do our case investigations, we had to move into quarantine in our close contact, which has which caused us to develop more quarantine facilities. I think we had quarantine, two or three quarantine facilities in Kingston. And then we also established facilities in um, St. James and then in other parts of the country to enable us to be able to identify persons who were close contacts of confirmed cases and be able to separate them from their homes. In that initial part of the management of COVID, our aim, of course, was to keep, to contain everybody, you know, that was infected and keep them away from the general population. As time went by, of course, the establishment of quarantine and isolation in home came with a lot of education, education of the public for them to be able to facilitate this. So the detection of cases, situations, assessment and movement of cases from one place to the other was a big part of our prevention and containment team in trying to really contain COVID-19. When we moved into another phase where we started to have re-entry of cruise ship workers and over 1,500 cruise ship workers were repatriated to Jamaica, we went into another area of containment where we now 
established um, facilities within hotels. We took over um, certain hotel facilities to be able to quarantine large numbers of persons. When we started out doing this, we were essentially testing everybody, putting them into a facility for 14 days and then retesting them. A large amount of work that involved the entire public health team. We had to take out persons from different facilities to be able to do testing, set up elaborate testing um, stations at the cruise ship ports to be able to manage this and then to move persons into facilities and to be able to monitor them. Our next step was when we moved into re-entry of persons by air, first or involuntary return migrants that were coming in from, from different countries that we also had to monitor these persons for a 14-day period. After that period starting at the end of May, coming into June, we looked now at the controlled re-entry of citizens. And we faced, we faced big problems here in terms of how to quarantine all of these persons. And we moved into a three-day quarantine period initially where persons were tested, quarantined until they got their results. And then they were sent home to home quarantine to be monitored by the health department and then for retest at 14 days. After a while, that became too much for us in terms of managing the thousands of persons that were coming in in a facility for three days or for 14 days. And so then we went to testing and home quarantine and monitoring of those persons. On the 16th of June, when we moved to the entry of tourists, again, a large amount of persons to deal with and elaborate set up at our airport in order to be able to test all these persons, get them to download a monitoring app and then to be able to geofence them at home and to perform quarantine in those facilities. And all of this came with, of course, when the positive results came back, now to extract those persons and to move them into isolation facilities where it was needed when we have symptomatic persons or be able to do home assessments to be able to keep them in their homes. So this prevention and containment strategy for us was a major, um, a major challenge that we took on the entire primary care team, public health team, persons in secondary care were all involved in this area in terms of being able to contain COVID-19. Our next area, next strategic area was situation monitoring and assessment. And this is a very dynamic area as we responded almost weekly or too weekly to the changes that were occurring in terms of detection of cases and changing our surveillance protocols. When we started out, we were, of course, um, adhering strictly to case definition. And these were the persons that we were going to be uh, if they met the definition of a suspected case, that we would test them, we would um, place them in isolation if positive, and we would do case investigation and contact tracing. After we had our first, our first um, imported case, then of course, in terms of the contact tracing and identification of persons who were close contacts and then realizing, of course, that we would have some undetected spread in our communities, we moved to the emphasis on our respiratory surveillance right across the island. We enhanced our normal respiratory surveillance in moving away from just taking doing surveillance from our sentinel sites to doing surveillance all influenza-like illnesses, all severe acute respiratory infections, all low admitted low respiratory tract infections from our primary care sites, from our secondary care sites, all facilities right across the island, we started to take samples from in being able to monitor what was happening across the country and be able to detect quickly whenever we had any kind of positive cases. 
So in terms of our respiratory surveillance, we have been in our greatest peak of, of course of cases have been in our case investigation and contact tracing, where we would have had almost 4,000 main contacts of confirmed cases. And our case investigation and contact tracing have yielded just about 70% of all our confirmed cases. In terms of our respiratory surveillance, we would have picked up 47 cases from our respiratory surveillance, and this would have been second, second highest yield in terms of the surveillance method that we used. Community surveillance was also an area that we had focused on, especially after we started to detect our clusters of cases. And so we moved to doing enhanced surveillance, respiratory surveillance, fever and respiratory surveillance in communities that were surrounding cases, surrounding clusters, but not as a part of the case investigation and contact tracing, meaning that there were no immediate contacts there. But in terms of doing the surveillance of those communities, we we have um, we have gone into over 2,000 households just across the island doing general community surveillance to be able to pick up cases. We have since then with our imported cases having detected some cases that were locally transmitted, having detected contact of these cases, we started to look at other areas in terms of surveillance to be able to pick up cases uh, where there was a possibility of spread. So of course, our healthcare worker surveillance, where we would have tested persons within our health facilities that would have been exposed, or who would have had respiratory symptoms or travel history, to be able to detect quickly if there were any healthcare workers that were affected. We also looked at our vulnerable populations and also put in surveillance protocols for testing our infirmary workers. So right across the island, we tested all our infirmary workers. And, and where we did detect one case, we of course tested all the persons within the infirmary. And each time we went into an infirmary, we also did fever and respiratory surveillance for the clients within the infirmary. We have looked at other settings. We have now started to do general hospital surveillance where admitted patients who are not necessarily COVID related, but elderly patients, patients who are immunocompromised, um, persons who are in our ICUs, we are testing all of these persons to ensure that we don't miss any cases. So our surveillance system has been very robust and very responsive to the changes that have occurred in the type of cases that we have seen over time. And we continue to monitor. We, we are moving to look at our vulnerable institutions to see where it is that we need to pick up any cases that there are the potential for great spread if they are positive. Our next strategic area for response was our health system response. And of course, what is um, very, very prominent and obvious is in terms of our case investigation and contact tracing, where we utilize the community health workforce, including our public health team of medical officers, public health nurses, or community health aides, and or in going out and doing our case investigation and contact tracing. Our aim has been to, to educate persons, to detect cases, to contain, to try to authorize or stamp out any kind of outbreak that may start, and of course, to provide continued monitoring. So we have had hundreds of healthcare workers that have gone into communities to systematically go from household to household in terms of our surveillance and in terms of our contact tracing to pick up contacts and to be able to follow up on these persons. We have had to utilize different approaches based on the different um, occurrences that have happened out of our investigation. Of course, initially we started out with the home quarantine and the isolation of contacts where our case investigation would have just included going into those homes, detecting the persons that were contacts, moving outward from the home into the community and going from contact to contact. But then when we were 
overwhelmed, we thought by if we if we were picking up large numbers of symptomatic contacts, then we moved into community quarantine, where the recognition was that with symptomatic contacts that were within the community for unknown periods moving around, then there was a possibility of infection within the community. And we have put about three communities on the quarantine for 14 days while we go through doing health promotion, education, and testing persons and doing our people and respiratory surveillance. We had to take a different approach when we had a period March 18 to 24, when we had a large amount of, of um, travelers that had come into the country that were more or less um, without health assessment. And for these persons, we had to resort to getting lists of persons, um, putting out for persons to call, call in, and our health department and the entire health workforce at the primary care level would follow up on these contacts, these, these numbers, these travelers, and go into their homes to find out if there was anybody that was having any problems. We had a, a very good response from the public. The call in of, to the health department of persons that were sick, we were able to pick up quite a few cases like this. But it was the continued work of the public health team in getting into the communities and tracking down these travelers, thousands of them, and we used both the National Security Force as well as the health department team to track down these travelers. I think it was about 7,000 persons in all, um, utilizing various methods to just, just to be able to pick up cases. In terms of our control reentry, we have had persons that have come in that all the persons that have come in have go into home quarantine. And again, in terms of the investigation that goes on from the health department side, all of these persons are monitored. And as the numbers get more, as we move now into thousands and thousands of persons, we now move into using our community or home quarantine app, which should come on stream shortly, where it is that persons will be able to monitor themselves at home, and we will be able to receive alerts from the health department as to those persons who have symptoms that, who, or who have increased temperature, that they will be red flagged, and the health department would be able to do their investigation in a more controlled way rather than have a lot of persons that we're following up at one time. In terms of case investigation and contact tracing went into a different realm when we had tourists to deal with who know we were once we started testing tourists and we had positive cases that we had to follow up on to then know our health departments know how to work with the hotels in terms of isolation in terms of any repeated tests that needed to take place, in terms of repatriation of persons, um, working with the airlines to inform of positive cases, and just to ensure that you know, there is control of this sector. So this team that works in case investigation and contact tracing in terms of this part of the health system response have had a variety of experience in different areas that they have, they have been working. In terms of the health system response in our health facilities, again, we've had new experiences here as we've had to establish quarantine and isolation and transition facilities um, over time where we, our health care workers have had to go out to be stationed in hotels to be able to monitor persons over a period of time. Um, we have had, because of the long times in which persons were taken to come back with a negative test, we had to establish transition facilities for these persons. So this was all new for us. We had to establish protocols as to how these eight different facilities were to be operated, what was the standard of care within these facilities, what was the call out in these facilities in case anybody did become sick and needed to be transferred. So that was a new era for us, and hundreds of persons were monitored in these facilities that was outside of our regular health facilities. 
of course, within our health facilities, we also have to establish um, protocols in terms of how we operate within our first contact areas in our health centers, in our emergency departments, where we have to establish respiratory areas that persons with respiratory symptoms would go to one section of the department and be triaged and dealt with in those areas, separating them from the rest of the health department and for the appropriate use of personal protective equipment in those areas. We also went on to establish COVID wards in all our health facilities and all our hospitals. Our aim was to establish at least 20 beds in each of our 24 hospitals that we were, would be able to, um, to admit persons in case there was a surge. Fortunately, we've not had to use more than 10% of those beds at the time for COVID patients, but we also had to go on to establish um, SAR rewards where persons who came in with respiratory illnesses, who there was a suspicion of COVID until they were COVID positive, were kept separately from the other patients. So that as well within our hospitals was um, uh, a lot of work in terms of getting these areas ready and prepared for COVID patients. And all our hospitals have fully participated in this and these areas are still available and we do still have some persons on our COVID wards. Another big area was the establishment, enhancing of our high dependency and intensive care capacity. Um, we have, our intention was to move from a situation where we would have about 26 to 30 um, ICU, HDU type beds in the island to know our aim is 105 of these beds. And we have moved considerably in this direction by getting in equipment, um, establishment of spaces that we have, we are able to offer high dependency care. In terms of communication, which is our fifth strategy, from very early Jamaica's approach has been grounded in increased public awareness. And we think that this is where our success so far lies um, from this from very early, um, oh, as I said, we've been working very closely with our PAHO Jamaica team. And from very early, we, we recognized the increased uh, messaging that was coming to us from the 6th of January, I believe, concerning what was happening with this new disease that was um, discovered in China. And from January the 20th, we had started our internal sensitization meetings. And as a matter of fact, we had our first press release on January the 20th and the start of our public sensitization program with full page ads in the newspaper. Our communication program has to have centered around health education of the healthcare worker and of the general population or aim to increase sensitization and awareness and of course to build personal responsibility that results in a big in behavior change. Our messages have been the same as other countries have mentioned in terms of personal hygiene measures, the use of masks, and all the other infection prevention and control measures. We have used various methods to keep the public informed, increased, including using information material, pamphlets, and posters that have thousands have been distributed to, to the public, general population in our healthcare facilities. We have our weekly press release that we keep the public informed. We also have a weekly and sometimes twice weekly press conferences, both from the Prime Minister's office as well as from the Health Ministry. We use social media. We regularly put out articles in the newspaper. So we have been really sensitizing the public and sensitizing our healthcare workers. And as I said, this is our real strength in the amount of information that the public has. And it is clear that many persons are acting on this. So those have been our five strategies, but in terms of our main cross-cutting theme in terms of what we have been trying to do is to protect the vulnerable. And where this is concerned, we have had our stay-at-home orders to decrease the risk of exposure and a phased return to normal for our 
over 60 times population. So far, that the over 60 age group has been the area where we have seen the most of our deaths. Unfortunately, we've had 10 deaths. Five of them have been in that over 60 age group. Chronic disease management, we have set up um, systems for continued care of our persons at risk, appointment system for clinics. So we have started um, restarting our elective surgery so that these illnesses don't become ignored. We have done quite a bit in terms of facilitating prescriptions, home deliveries of um, prescription items to all our persons over age 65 that are registered in our public clinic. Um, in terms of our re-entry program, our, our website, we use that to identify the at-risk persons as well as, as at-risk homes and at-risk communities so that we can target intervention. And of course, our community engagement program where we're increasing awareness within the communities and we are using our community health aids to get to the vulnerable population. And we are also increasing our patient care attendance within hospitals to ensure that there is communication with in persons who are admitted in hospitals, addressing the psychosocial issues, loneliness and anxiety that, that results from being admitted for long periods in hospitals. Also, another cross-cutting air theme in our approach has been the use of technology, where we have utilized technology in terms of our surveillance. We have been working with Tahoe in terms of utilizing the Go data. It has not come on stream as yet, but we have been working to build our resources and our capacity here in terms of being able to collect data within the field and for it to be immediately available for analysis at the central and regional levels. We have also looked at our building of use of technology in making results available from the laboratory to link the system, the information system within the laboratory to the parishes and the regions and to the health facilities so that results become available. We have been using telemedicine in terms of the the um, consultation with some persons who are at home in our clinic. And this is something that we are building out to enhance this, to decrease the crowding, and to be able to maintain physical distancing within our health facilities. In terms of communication, the communication materials that we have been using, we have been focusing a lot on the use of social media, but also a lot in terms of the use of our website and use of our app so that our clients can communicate with us without having to come in, without having to move to, to get into any kind of crowded situations. We have been utilizing technology there. We have also been using technology at our point of entry where we have our Jam COVID app where all our persons who are returning and now every single soul that returns to Jamaica whether it is the tourists that is coming that they visit the Visit Jamaica site or Jamaicans that are returning, they have to register on the Jam COVID site. So we have a lot more knowledge in terms of the persons that are coming in and we are able to identify risk factors and to be able to target those risk factors. In terms of coordination, in terms of the communication between our health facilities or regions or parishes and the central ministry, we have been doing a lot of work here to enhance that, that communication and to ensure that information that is coming in is fed centrally so that analysis can be done. These are all areas that we are working on strengthening and that we have had considerable strengthening over time. Now, right from the start, our aim has been to build capacity, to keep the numbers or numbers low that below the, the ability of our health system to respond and to use that time to ensure that, the num that we build capacity so that if we have a surge, then we are able to respond. In terms of building capacity, we're not just only looking at building capacity to, to respond now, but also to respond in the future. And so we have done a lot of work where, where that is concerned 
And just to look at some of the areas in terms of the points of entry, where we now have a system that is streamlined, that all immigration matters are handled through one website, and health has access to this so that we are able to monitor the persons that are coming in and to identify risks that are there. In terms of laboratory strengthening, with the help of CAHO, we had established at our National Influenza Center from in early February the ability to test for COVID using the open PCR system. Since then, we have also established at our National Public Health Lab the use of the COVAX system, and we have also received um, more open PCR systems that we are able to set up to be able to increase our capacity to test. We have also increased our capacity to be able to sample, um, which is a, is a big deal because from where we're starting from, where persons were finding it difficult, persons were fearful of taking samples, we've done a lot of training, we've done a lot of field testing, and we have rolled out our mobile units that these units go out to assist in the taking of samples. We also put in place our testing booths that we are now able to do testing without the use of all the PPE, so we're able to save on PPE. So these are all areas that going forward will enable us to sample easier and to be able to test to increase our capacity to test. In terms of monitoring, we have increased our numbers of community health care workers, over 1,300 additional community health care workers we have been given full for to be able to enhance our community work. We have received support from PAHO and USAID in terms of procurement of computers, tablets, and cellular phones so that persons are able to, to be in contact. And of course, we have the Jam COVID app that we're going to be utilizing for home quarantine. In terms of case management, we have increased the numbers of beds, high dependency units, beds that we have across the island. We have built new space, we have refurbished space, we have enhanced other areas, and we have purchased quite a bit of uh, the entire set of not including vent, not only including ventilators, but all the paraphernalia in terms of syringe pumps, infusion pumps, suction machines, monitors, defibrillators, to totally um, build out a high-dependency high site. In addition, we have had a lot of partnerships with a lot of different agencies. Here we see where we have received from Japan a gift of um, mobile X-ray units that we are going to use further, mobile X-ray and ultrasound units that we're going to be able to use further in our high dependency areas. So this is some of the work that we have done and that we have continued to do. It's only a scratch on the surface, but this is how our entire primary health care workforce has been working, um, addressing all the different areas of this primary health care that we need to respond to COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Bisasur McKenzie, um, for that very comprehensive presentation. I'm going to take back the presenter privileges, and if you'd like to close your microphone. Um, so again, thank you very much. I think we've had uh, four excellent presentations giving a synopsis of the various approaches that different countries have taken within the region uh, of the Caribbean to COVID-19 utilizing uh, the first primary healthcare approaches. And I think we've seen that there's been a large emphasis on communication, obviously preparation and investment, uh, particularly in the first level of care. Uh, I've been pleased to see the attention paid to the preparation and monitoring and uh, scaling up of human resources and ensuring that they're properly equipped and protected, uh, as well as seeing the engagement with the community and the use of interprofessional teams. There still remain many challenges as our speakers spoke to. Um, unfortunately, we have gone over time. Um, 
and I would say for virtue of time, we, we had up to 150 people at its height, uh, and I know, I think I will ask your indulgence maybe to take one or two questions, and that is it. Um, and then we will uh, close the session. So if, if everyone's amenable to that, we might just take a couple questions. So please raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. I'm going to ask you to be very brief. If it's for a specific speaker, please indicate for whom is the question. Uh, otherwise, I, I will choose who is the person best to address that question. If there aren't any questions, then uh, I think we will go ahead and and close our session. So please let me know. I actually do not see any questions in the room. So um, with that, up, just one moment. Um, I think I heard someone's hand go up. Okay, so there is one question. Again, I'm going to ask the person making the question to be very brief. Uh, and if there's anyone else, kindly raise your hand now because we will do just one round, a couple of questions, and then we will close. So I have Dr. Danielle Domersant. If you'd like to go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, we hear you fine. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your presentation. My question was general is general to all um, speakers um, regarding uh, reduction of availability of um, the available um, primary services, either due to reduction of services or um, reduce um, seeking behavior of care for the patients. Are there any primary um, documentation or studies on um, changes in morbidity or mortality in terms of um, of uh, non COVID nineteen related diseases? I don't know if I, my question is is clear. Yes, I believe it is. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. That's a very good, very good question. So I don't see any other questions or comments in the room. So I think we will go ahead and pass to each of our speakers uh, for response to that. And if you have any final words or messages you'd like to make at the same time, um, uh, we will, you can do so at this moment. We're going to go in the same order that we started, uh, starting with Dr. Holder. So um, if you'd like to, respond to the question and then any brief comments you'd like to add in closing remarks. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And um my congratulations to the presenters to your excellent presentations. Um uh and they <clears throat> portrayed very uh excellent uh, experiences that we can all learn from. Uh <clears throat> to Dr. Gomersant, yeah it's still it's it's quite early in the in the in the response uh, for certain types of studies. I think a lot of the the research and uh, publications are now still focused on COVID itself and the disease and and the lessons learned from uh, countries that already went went through the first uh, peak of the of the pandemic are not uh, very abundant. Or can be found. Uh, I haven't seen any study on the effects of reduction of essential services on the morbidity and mortality. I think that's a very important aspect that we need to research. We need to be able to establish what was the impact of some of the measures that were taken early to um, respond, but that could have affected other patients and other uh, and the, and the, the healthcare seeking behavior of. Um, of the communities. Uh, that is something that, that we've been discussing at PAHO and we're looking at the possibility of looking into that type of research, but uh, we still kind of, you know, swamped with a lot of the response issues. But thank you for, for bringing that forward. I, I from Belize, 
Uh, there's a question about strategies that were put in place to ensure the, the community was continually engaged for compliance, participation, et cetera. I think that was uh, covered by the presenters. We make the presentation available to all participants who wish to have them, and then uh, maybe uh, they, that there, be, uh, there are responses to, to this question and to many of your, your questions that maybe you have not uh, posed at this moment will be you ready to look at once you have the presentations. If not, then uh, of course our email address will be available for any further consultation. I would just like to uh, finalize by saying um, um, you see excellent presentation. I continue to underline excellent presentations show that uh, one, the experience in the countries are very, uh, are very practical and very uh, valuable for us to learn from the region. Uh, it, 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 lessons learned already are, are emerging from this experience. It shows the importance of plan response, and also to, in the case of Bahamas, who is already looking at planning for the return to normal. And despite the fact that we know that this is a long-term event that uh, we really normal will not be achieved until we have an effective vaccine, uh, we, we cannot leave that type of planning for for later. We need to to anticipate what will be the the, the needs and the the configuration of health services that will emerge from this emerge from this uh, pandemic and how we need to prepare for that. Dominica, Jamaica, and Jamaica has, has underscored the, uh, the 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 strengths coming out of their long tradition of primary health care and strengthening of the first level of care. I think a lot of what they have done and, and, and what we have learned this afternoon from them comes from that long uh, tradition and the emphasis of strengthening their, 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 their first level of care uh, throughout the, the recent decades. Um, very interesting the experience on stigmatization that was presented by Dr. Sri. I think that um, Dr. Sri, I think that um, uh, we need to look closer at, at that, especially in very uh, in some of the small communities and some of the rural areas. Here in Panama, where I where I am, uh, we have had a lot of uh, difficulties with patients returning from uh, quarantine or. Uh, to their communities, some of them have been denied entry into the community because of, of these um, issues and uh, the health and services and overall the, the response mechanism in the country into, the, into this. I think your your experience from Dominica would be uh, helpful in learning uh, how to move forward. Dr. Dr. Laura also insisted, uh, presented the importance of an appointment system that is emerging out of the response, you have an appointment system for the response, and uh, there's, there's a value in keeping that beyond uh, the epidemic, the pandemic. Uh, one of the, the, the weak spots of a lot of our first level of care uh, providers and health centers is the, the lack of an adequate appointment system that regulates the access of patients to those facilities. And um, Jamaica has presented the, 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 a lot of things that we, we can learn from. We, we hope to be able to share, share, they'll share with us uh, the lessons coming out of that, but also the protocols that have been prepared that will assist other countries in uh, addressing some of the issues that uh, countries may not have seen, uh, may not have foreseen as Jamaica has and may become an issue in, in the organization of the services in the future, for instance, uh, how you move from one quarantine facility to the other, how, um, how the quarantine, isolation, and, and transition protocols need to be established and, and work. And the very, the very important uh, public awareness lessons that are coming out of Jamaica and other countries, is, I would say that. Uh, in Jamaica, has been successful, as, as uh, Dr. McKenzie has said. In other countries, that was abandoned early, and it has created problems because when there is no clear communication with the public, then it leaves open um, for all the, 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 the things that you can find on social media that do not help and create uh, a, a negative situations in, in the public. So it's very important for the national authorities to 
continue to strengthen and continue the public awareness strategies that will keep people informed. And to then I, I think uh, I would uh, express personal opinion. Uh, I think this, this, these presentations and the experience that we're seeing with COVID-19 underscores the great need to move from curative hospital-based approaches to health systems and ratifies the wisdom of strengthening the first level of care, the wisdom of strengthening primary health care based systems, the strategies that are focused on the overall activity of the different levels of the health system and the strengthening of the capacity at the local levels, at the community levels, to be active participants in the response to public health issues such as this and to many other issues in the health system. I think this is this uh, at the end would be a successful a success story for uh, strengthening the first level of care. I thank you very much for the opportunity of being here today. Back to you, Anela. Thank you very much, Reynaldo. Um, and I apologize that I had missed originally the question of the link in the chat, so I'm just going to read it. And perhaps if one of the other speakers don't feel obliged, if you want to address it in your final comments. Um, the question was, what were the challenges in engaging community participation and how were they overcome? And what strategies were put in place to ensure the community was continually engaged for compliance, participation in the planning process, provision of information feedback, and response to prevention and prevention. So, just kind of a little more, um, maybe some of those who uh, did talk about it but did not go as much into depth about that issue may wish to address it. So um, we have that and then the first question and any final comments or messages you would like to convey to Dr. Bartlett, I'm going to pass to you. So you can go ahead and open the mic if you would like. For any final comments. Me too. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Thank you. Oh, yes, and it was very informative. Learned a lot from all the speakers. This is truly a good experience to hear from the neighboring Caribbean countries. So, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, we will now move, if you want, I believe those were your own comments, so if you'd like, I will now move to the next uh, speaker. Um, just one moment again. Sorry, I move people back to attendee to make it easier to manage the mic. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Laura Esprit, if you wish to address any of the questions and also any final comments you would like to convey at this time. So I, I think Dr. Esprit is not available at the moment, so um, we will finalize with uh, Dr. Bishop McKenzie, if you have any, just uh, if you would like to address that final question. And I actually think we may have lost it as well. Um, oh, no, there. Okay. Just one moment, please. Dr. McKenzie, if you have anything that you would like to uh, just to uh, answer the question about community engagement or about um, other morbidities at this time and any final comment if you could be brief because we're already about 30 minutes. Thank you. Hello? Yes, we hear you fine. Okay. Um, well, in terms of the, the mortality, um, so we have two, we usually use two modalities to determine um, mortality surveillance which would be our vital statistics registration and our hospital debt. Um, so we, we don't have all the figures in from our registrar general department in terms of 
vital statistics. However, in terms of our hospital debt, um, what we have observed is that our hospital debt since the beginning of the outbreak in January has really been below the level of previous years. So we have not been seeing um, any increased number of deaths. Um, we have, while we have not had official communication, we have been constantly communication with our communicating with our registrar general department and with our government pathologists to ensure that we would be able to detect if there are any causes of death unknown for which there has been no COVID testing done to see if there are any missed cases that would be there. And so far, we do not have any cases. So we have not seen an increase in the number of deaths, generally speaking, and we have not seen any suspected COVID deaths outside of the ones that we are picking up through our um, management of the disease. So that's to answer that question. In terms of challenges in engaging the community, um, I think things have changed a bit um, over time. But I think a lot of people are still very apprehensive. There is still a lot of stigma that is associated um, with COVID. Persons, we still have aggressive and hostile responses that we pick up in our community surveillances when we do have positive cases and that we have to go into communities. Our experiences have been varied. I remember when we first started out trying to establish quarantine facility in, um, in communities and the amount of pushback and, you know, the hostility that greeted us was quite phenomenal at that early time. Um, now, we still have instances where, you know, persons who are COVID positive are being threatened. We've had to put persons into state facilities because they are threatened in their homes, um, persons threatened to burn them out, persons threatened to do all kinds of different things. So we still have a lot of um, issues that we have to deal with. And especially in our vulnerable communities where we have a, a lot of persons living in a smaller area and also that the, the socioeconomic status is quite low. Um, we have, in those situations, you know, we have to move to get old persons quickly out of those communities and into state facilities because of, you know, the stigma that is associated. We continue, though, and this is one, a big thrust going forward as, as we go into this recovery phase and is living with COVID. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be rolling out a more intensive inside the community um, getting persons to understand their need to support persons that have COVID rather than, you know, being hostile or aggressive towards them. Because that's, if we don't develop that kind of communication, um, the personal responsibility that persons have to report and to protect the vulnerable, that's where we're going to, to lose if every single community member don't understand the importance of the restrictions that need to take place in the infection prevention and control measures that every soul needs to practice, and especially the persons that are positive and are not supportive of persons doing it, you know, then we're going to lose the battle. So it really is not the testing and it's really not the hospital beds or the ICU beds. It is really the community engagement and everybody taking on that personal responsibility to protect themselves and their families and the country at the large that is going to help us to win this battle. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Bifusur McKenzie. Um, and I'm going to go back to Dr. Laura Esprit, uh, to see if you would like to make any final comments, and after that, we will close the session. I do see there are more questions in the chat, but unfortunately, because of time factor, we won't be able to take them at this time. Um, I think uh, 
those who have my email, please feel free to send me your questions. Um, I think most of you do, and uh, we will be happy to take them offline with our speakers. So, Dr. Esprit, if you have any final comments you'd like to make at this point. And to make it a little easier for you. So, I believe that uh, she is not able at this moment. Um, so, uh, without further ado, then, I think I will go ahead and uh, close the session. Again, I want to thank our distinguished panelists, Dr. Folder, Neely Bartlett, Free, and Lisa Sue McKenzie, for your excellent presentations. Again, just like uh, Reynaldo said, I stress excellent. I think they were all very informative, and we could probably be here the entire day discussing uh, the various things that not only your countries, but other countries have been uh, around primary health care in relation to the pandemic. Um, I want to thank again Dr. Reynaldo Hogan for his collaboration in organizing this webinar, uh, Drs. Gabriel Vivas, Rufus Ewing, Casimiro Canjadias, who are the HHS advisors for PAHO WHO in Bahamas, Eastern Caribbean, and Jamaica, respectively, for their assistance in securing our excellent speakers, as well as uh, Ms. Anik Wilson for her assistance uh, in, uh, with, in facilitating the participation of Dr. Spruce and Dominica. Uh, and finally, uh, Dr. Henry Sarag, who is uh, at the University of Texas Medical Branch, who has so kindly agreed to uh, lend us a hand with some of his bilingual students there at the university uh, at UTMB Galveston to translate the PowerPoint into Spanish afterwards for those who were requesting the same. So we will be uh, disseminating both the recording and the presentation to you all, uh, if not later this week, then definitely by early next week. So thank you again and have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye.